Good afternoon. I'm Todd Mission from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and the Drive Digital Repository. And I'd like to talk today about data as research output, data as part of the scholarly record. Uh, if we're seeing this video, it means my uh, slides weren't available to broadcast to you all, so I uh, apologize for that. I will try to muddle through my presentation as best I can without them. I regret I can't be there in person to celebrate the 15th anniversary of the uh, organization with you all and, and uh, have face-to-face -face discussions, but um, I uh, will be online and happy to take questions and join the conversation from here in North Carolina. So it used to be that what you published in a scientific journal was confined to what could be printed on a page, and that has obviously changed in recent years. Now, even in beautiful libraries, um, students and researchers and everyone else uh, go online to access their information from computer monitors. Open access journals have taken advantage of this um, in order to make the distribution of digital copies cheap and easy, and it makes it possible to imagine uh, scientific content being free to the user, free to the reader. Uh, but it also changes what we can communicate because we're no longer bound by the constraints of paper, and it frees us to think more holistically about what we should communicate in our research uh, to make the greatest impact and to do the greatest good. So a big missing piece of what we don't communicate currently is data. So I'm an empirical scientist. My colleagues and I spend months collecting data and processing it and analyzing it. And then we write an article, and that describes why we collected it and how we processed it and how we analyzed it and what we found in it. It has figures. It has tables with summaries of data. It reports conclusions from data but it doesn't actually include the published data itself. We just published the tip of the iceberg. At the bottom of this iceberg is a, a big uh, volume of raw data. For instance, in my group, we have terabytes of raw DNA sequencing data that are stored away on disk. It may have some value for others, but it's not clear that it does. It's not been processed. It's not been made ready for analysis. It doesn't consist of the numbers or the data points that are immediately behind any published table or figure that, ever written. Uh, so I would argue that in between that raw data at the bottom and the stuff that gets published at the tip of the iceberg in the paper itself, there's a middle layer where we should focus our attention. That's uh, process data uh, that backs up the findings that are in the published literature. It's already passed this important threshold of quality assurance by the original investigators and peer reviewers in the journal. Um, and it already has useful documentation attached to it, and that's the publication itself. We have some means of understanding that data if we aren't the original investigators. So others can come, take that data, see whether the results hold up to independent analysis, which is important because many published findings are actually not correct. Uh, they can look at the data in new ways. They can do meta-analysis across different studies of the same phenomenon. They can integrate it with different kinds of data altogether and allow very different kinds of questions to be asked. So if we uh, do publish this data alongside the article, it's available for others to do all these great things. And it's also available to ourselves to do uh, things with it down the road. Um, we can return to that data. It's preserved for our own use as well. So a big incentive for uh, encouraging people to um, publish data alongside articles is that they can increase their scientific impact and they can actually get professional credit for doing so. So a recent analysis that I uh, co-authored with a postdoc, um, Heather Pavovar, who's now uh, full-time uh, working on Impact Story, the Altmetrics uh, nonprofit. Uh, we studied gene expression microarray data sets that were either made openly available uh, along with articles or not, and uh, looked to see how the citation rate was affected between those two classes. And over all the years that we examined, the, there was an overall boost to having open data of about 9% in the years where the citations actually have had enough time to accumulate from about 2004, 2005, the boost was as high as 30%. So uh, that's some incentive there. Uh, in addition, we see that uh, papers are reusing gene expression data sets from public archives increasingly over time. More papers are publishing reuse, and more data sets are used in each instance of reuse, in each paper that, that does reuse it. So we are seeing uh, an increasing 
amount of data science happening where investigators are, are taking advantage of what is available online to do new science, and maybe do science in different ways than uh, what we can do by just collecting the data uh, one data set at a time. And uh, so the value of making one's data open is, I think, going to be increasing over time. Some more stories could surely be told for astronomy, for social science, uh, public health, and other disciplines. Um, genomics is somewhat special in that there's been a long-standing culture of data sharing. Many journals require it to be shared. Many uh, specialized archives exist for it. But even in uh, genomics, uh, it's still rather spotty. So in the case of the data that we were looking at, about 25% of the articles actually archived the data alongside uh, the publication, and 75% of them did not that we could find. So the situation is probably much worse in what we'll call the long tail of data, where it's not a specialized um, repository data type. It's not a gene sequence or a, a occurrence record that GBIF would know. Um, these are biological examples, obviously, which I know. Um, spreadsheets of measurements that are idiosyncratic that some graduate student uh, devised a unique format because that study's never been seen before and may never be seen again uh, in the future. These, these are long tail data. And while each individual data set may be idiosyncratic, it can be reused by other specialists in the field if it's adequately documented. And collectively, long tail data probably comprises most of the valuable process data that underlies the scientific literature. So we need to come up with a solution for archiving long tail data uh, since we're not going to have a specialized repository for every data type in the world. The traditional way in which uh, long tail data has been shared is through informal agreements between parties. So another researcher requests the data of the original one, and it's left to the original researcher to decide whether to honor that request and on what terms. Uh, lots of studies have shown that uh, data sharing upon requests like this uh, fails a lot. It's inefficient. It has uh, undesirable social dynamics. So one group uh, from the Netherlands um, requested data systematically from over 140 papers in a, a set of journals where there was a policy that they were required to share the data if they were requested. It took them six months, hundreds of emails, sent detailed descriptions of study aims, approval of ethical committees, signed assurances not to share it further, full resumes, etc. Even then, uh, the data was only provided by 27% of the authors. In some cases, they may have, these original authors may have decided that they didn't want to share the data. In others, they may uh, not have been able to share the data because the memory has faded as to what files uh, were relevant, the graduate student departed with the critical files, etc. cetera. So um, the solution to this problem, I would argue, is to document and publish the data alongside the article. Uh, before then, it's probably too early because it's too raw. And after then, it's too late. Um, and it shouldn't be up to the original investigator to decide which requests they're going to honor or not, uh, make it available uniformly in an open way to the world. So a uh, classic data set in my own field of evolutionary biology uh, was reported uh, over 100 years ago by a fellow named Bumpus who studied natural selection in sparrows. It was one of the sort of first evolutionary studies in a natural population. The actual data happened to be published as an enormous table over many pages of the article. Um, and because the data were so good and available and well documented and valuable, they've been used hundreds of times since uh, that occasion, probably thousands of times, in fact, um, not just for research, for testing the methodologies, but also for teaching, appearance of textbooks and classrooms and so on. Uh, so these data have had a huge impact. and. Uh, there are millions of articles published each year, and so there are probably millions of data sets like these Bumpus Sparrow spreadsheets that could be published but aren't. Um, and we don't know how many of them would have a uh, fraction of the useful life, the useful afterlife that Bumpus and Sparrows have had. I think it's fair to say that many papers are published where the data would be more valuable than the article itself over the long term. But right now, there's not a uh, venue for the publication of those. 
So it's a huge missed opportunity. We should facilitate the publication of this middle tier of the iceberg of, of forgotten long tail data. It's not only uh, for the good of science, but it's potentially for the good of the researchers themselves if we can ensure that they get credit for doing so. Only now we don't have to use paper like Bumpus did. Uh, we can use a repository that provides a lot more functionality. So one of these repositories is Dryad, uh, the Dryad Digital Data Repository. Uh, Dryad got its start when a group of journal editors from a number of leading evolutionary biology journals uh, decided to introduce a joint data archiving policy. And this policy, which we call JDAP, uh, starts by stating the principle that data are important products of the scientific enterprise. They should be preserved and usable for decades into the future. As a condition for publication, data supporting the results in the article are to be deposited in an appropriate public archive of the journal's choice. Authors may elect embargo access to the data for a period up to a year after publication. And exceptions may be granted at the discretion of the editor, especially for sensitive information. So those are the conditions of, of the JDAP. The journals uh, that adopted this, and it rolled out in January of 2011, they were confident that this was a good policy change. The research community had expressed their enthusiasm in surveys beforehand, and they knew that the escape clauses about embargoes and exceptions um, were enough to convince most skeptics that they, uh, they should abide by it. So it's been largely welcomed in the community, even though there continues to be debate about when and how to grant exceptions and uh, whether one year embargo length is the right balance. I believe we're seeing rapid culture change in evolutionary biology and ecology as a result of this policy. Uh, data archiving is now the expectation rather than the exception, uh, and that's open data archiving. So we've been conducting a survey of authors in these journals and other journals since before the policy went into effect through to now and for a few more months, um, and we'll get to test whether my impression of that is actually correct. So it helped that JDAP was adopted simultaneously by uh, many leading journals in, in one discipline. But many journals have independently and individually strengthened their own data policies in recent years. Um, and a recent survey by Heather Pavovar, again, with some other colleagues uh, of about 70 biomedical journals found that there was actually a relationship between the strength of the data policy and the impact factor of the journal. So strength being measured by whether they require or just encourage archiving or just sharing upon request, um, and whether they do this for all types of data or just the kinds that fit in certain specialized databases. Um, and what I think this is telling us is that the strength of the data policy is one of the dimensions on which journals are competing to distinguish themselves in quality and in prestige against their international competition. So the journals behind JDAP realized that in order to implement uh, their policy, there needed to be a long tail data repositories that uh, their authors would be happy with. And so they conceived the Dryad as a shared resource that any researcher in the community could use to archive their data. It needed to be coupled with the submission process of the journals so that the data could be reviewed and would be reciprocally linked from the article. It needed to support the possibility of an embargo if an author requested it. It needed to be very easy to submit data online without imposing um, elaborate metadata requirements or formatting requirements that the journal wasn't party to. Uh, it needed some user support and quality control, but not so much that the curation costs would be prohibitive. Um, and it needed the data to be given permanent identifiers and indexed so that it could be independently discovered. And it needed to ensure that there was a preservation plan in place, which many supplemental materials at journals don't have. So the most unusual of these steps is probably the submission integration. It may be worth saying a bit more about how that works. Basically, the journal and the repository communicate behind the scenes to send metadata back and forth so that each has accurate metadata and each knows the status of the submission of the other party. It's accomplished with fairly lightweight communication, uh, automated emails, and Dryad so far set this up with journals that use a variety of different manuscript processing systems from OJS to Manuscript Central. So it's uh, not specific to any one publication platform. And at the end of the process, then, the article and the data each get a DOI or each published at the same time, 
Um, the author list may even differ between the data and the article because different people may want to claim credit for different parts of the work. Um, the data gets linked from the article according to the journal style and Dryad will link back to the article um, so that the two um, works are forever connected with persistent identifiers. So an important part of Dryad's mission is for that data to be open and free. So by free, I mean both free to reuse without a license uh, restriction of any kind. There's just an expectation that users will follow scholarly norms for citation um, and free in that it, it costs nothing to actually download the data and reuse it. Uh, to fulfill that mission, uh, Dryad Incorporated is a nonprofit in 2012. Uh, it's governed by a board that's elected by member organizations. So members may be any stakeholder that supports Dryad's mission. That could include a scientific society or a publisher, university library or research funders. Um, Dryad's still a relatively small organization, but uh, the curation and the maintenance of the repository does have costs. So the operating revenues come out of these uh, memberships from organizations and they come out of one-time upfront data publication charges. So Dryad uh, also gets grants for research and development. Uh, we have a large grant from the NSF in the US right now, um, but the operating costs that keep the lights on are from these other sources that are uh, scalable and steady. Uh, the data publication charge is between 65 and 90 US dollars. That covers up to 10 uh, gigabytes of data associated with an individual publication. The fees at the lower end when it's paid in advance by a sponsoring member organization um, and at the higher end when it isn't. So most deposits now, uh, and we rolled uh, these charges out in the beginning of September of this year, so it's still young. Uh, but most deposits now are sponsored by some organization, often a publisher or society, and most come through an integrated partner journal. However, we do accept deposits from individual researchers as long as it's associated with some publication, an article, a book, a thesis, uh, from some reputable source. And when there's no sponsor, individual researchers either pay for the deposit charge out of their own research funds, or if they're from a World Bank low or lower middle income economy, uh, then the fee is waived. So how is it doing? So Dryad launched in 2009. It still has um, a lot of content from ecology and evolutionary biology, but it does accept data from throughout science and medicine and has a number of medical journals uh, that are integrated. Data is very broadly defined. We leave the policy about what to deposit very much in the hands of the different journals. Their policies vary widely. Some require the data before review, some only after acceptance. Some allow embargoes and some don't. Some use Dryad for all the supplemental materials, only uh, some, some others only use it for certain kinds of data files. So a data package, as I said, corresponds to one article or book or thesis, and Dryad is now receiving about 50 new data packages every week. That rate of deposition has been approximately doubling each year. So um, it uh, would be a very large journal if it was a journal. Uh, the articles are coming from a wide variety of different journals. We have 37 with integrated submission at the moment and adding more all the time. But we've received content uh, from articles that are in over 250 different journals. And we're happy that we're seeing lots of usage. So there have been millions of file downloads in total uh, since its inception in 2009. And those are coming from all over the world. So Drive reports the download statistics for each file and each data package so the authors can see when their data is getting high reuse. Uh, we expose those downloads to altmetric uh, resources like Impact Story. We're just beginning to track data citations as well. Um, so we're working with organizations like Datacite and Impact Story and Thomson Reuters uh, to make sure that researchers do get credit when they publish data. and. Uh, if the community finds it valuable for research or for teaching, that should be reflected in the credit that the original authors get. So I'd love to say more and um, talk about all the other organizations that are doing great work to make research data open and an integral part of scholarly communication, but I think that's all the time I have available. So um, if you'd like to learn more, I encourage you to go to the Dryad website. It's datadryad.org. Um, feel free to contact us um, by Twitter or email if you have any questions. And uh, I'll post um, 
my slides to slide share so that you can see what I would have shown if I could have. Uh, and uh, this video will obviously be available. So we'd be delighted to have any uh, members or journal partners from within uh, the Cielo community. So please don't hesitate to get in touch. And again, my sincere regrets, I couldn't be there in person. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the rest of the conference.